is Dr. Bitcoin. Uh, Ow! Yeah, Dr. Bitcoin. Uh, hey, Mark. Uh, Mark is a futurist and blockchain evangelist in 2017 and 18. Um, he served as an advisor or C-level executive to a variety of blockchain projects, very token and robokind among them. Um, he founded Roger Wilco originally as a content marketing firm and later spun it out as a marketing agency uh, focused on blockchain and cognitive consulting and research. Um, in mid-2016, he accepted a partnership at the newly created Dallas office for Barista Ventures, which remains a nexus for activity in the Dallas startup scene. Um, much of Mark's notoriety arises from past forays into new media, like founding Silicon Angel Media or serving as associate editor at Mashable. Fantastic. Uh, and also the creation of the world's first podcast hosting service. Fantastic. Um, let's all welcome Mark. Thank you. Well, hello, glad to be here. I am going to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, thank you. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of blockchain today. I'm gonna to use that as a, uh, a vehicle to kind of give everybody a level, I mean, you did a level, good, great job doing a level set. This is kind of the, the vehicle I kind of try to use to put everybody on the same page when it comes to blockchain. Um, it's, uh, it's, it goes back pretty far, actually. Uh, I, my timeline covers 1978 to the present. Uh, most people don't realize that quite goes back that far, but uh, like you said, uh, Ask Dr. Bitcoin is one of my websites, Roger Wilco, you can find me in a bunch of these different locations. Um, this is a presentation that I usually have an hour and a half to deliver when I'm teaching at SMU or UTD, so I'm gonna go fast on a lot of these things. For those of you that are blockchain fluent, uh, some of this will give you a little bit of a, a idea of where my perspective comes from. Um, because uh, while it is just a protocol, it's a protocol that people are already getting very dogmatic about. And so there's a variety of philosophies within the world of blockchain. I'm, I'm a tokenization max once, that means I, I'm really a big fan of public blockchains versus private blockchains. I design these things for a living, so I'm a, I would like to push the boundaries of what's possible. I'm really interested in that stuff. I personally identify as a cypherpunk, which is kind of where this philosophy came from. And I'm also, like you said, an IBM futurist, so I also get very much exposed to the enterprise side of things with this stuff. So um, this is a very dense sentence that I use to explain what blockchain is or what Bitcoin is. Um, it is a, Bitcoin is the reference protocol for blockchain which is a, decent, is a decentralized protocol for removing the requirement for trust between counterparties. Um, to unpack that a little bit, basically if you can imagine a situation where uh, trust is a vector of attack in any type of counterparty relationship, blockchain is a protocol for assisting in uh, removing that, that vector of attack, for basically making it easier for people to do business. So uh, this is different from other forms of databases and protocols because like he said, fully decentralized. I don't have to go through all this stuff again because you just spent a little bit of time going through that. Um, if there's no owner, how is the integrity maintained? If it's decentralized, how does all that work? Uh, through Bitcoin, it's with miners. Through other types of public blockchains, there's systems called proof of stake, proof of authority, proof of... Uh, there's a, there's a variety of different things, but they all kind of arise out of the same concept where you have people who are incentivized to maintain the ledger. Um, and it all is, uh, revolves around a concept that I'll get into in a second called Byzantine Fault Tolerance. Um, why does all this matter? Um, a few years ago, uh, right as the price of Bitcoin started skyrocketing, uh, IBM, who had been working on blockchain for some time, uh, decided to announce they were going to uh, put their put their full weight behind it. You know, basically, uh, Anne and I were at an IBM show, and she spent half her keynote time talking about Watson, which makes sense because they've been working on that for 13 years, and half their time talking about blockchain, which shocked the crap out of all of us. Um, and since then, Oracle and all the other enterprise players have gotten into it. And you've got marketing budgets that exceed the size of all cryptocurrency market caps put together promoting the idea of blockchain to people with multi-billion dollar budgets. So it's around and it's gonna be here to stay. Um, this is something we don't have 
too much time to go into, but he mentioned some ways of classifying cryptocurrency and blockchain projects. This is some research that Roger Wolf has been working on and will be releasing very soon, um, but this is, we've been kind of circulating it within the community. It's a, called a token classification framework. And he mentioned uh, that there's cryptocurrencies and asset tokens or security tokens and utility tokens is one way to classify it. We've actually identified five to seven different spectrums like that. You can maybe snapshot that or ask me for a copy of the presentation later and I'll, I'll provide you some more detail. But there's a lot of different things that we'll get into piece by piece throughout the history of blockchain that you'll see that these are different ways of classifying these projects and thinking about your blockchain projects more than just you know what's a currency and what's it trading at online somewhere. So into the history. Byzantine fault tolerance. This is probably the biggest concept that if you can grok this today, you can understand everything else about blockchain. So the, the Byzantine general's problem was first posed in the late 70s, early 80s. It is as old as I am. And the idea is you've got 10 generals in the Byzantine army, and unlike the, the armies of today, these are peer generals. They don't have a hierarchy. They don't answer to one general at the top. And so if You've got all these generals, and they're, they're about to participate in a battle. This battle is going to be decisive for the war of uh, whatever the campaign they're participating in. You know, if they win this battle, they could possibly win the war. If they retreat from the battle in unison, they could uh, also live to fight another day. But if they act out of concert, the whole campaign is lost, the empire is dead. Right? This is the problem we're trying to solve. To make matters worse, not all these generals are loyal to the empire. Some of them are, have their own factions or they're traitors to the empire and the communications methods that they're using to communicate, whether they be uh, 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 carrier pigeon or uh, couriers, also may be loyal to other factions or the enemy or whatever. So the, the communications method is not always reliable. How do you organize a, a, a coordinated effort and have everybody act in unison? That's the problem. Uh, it's a problem that's applicable to aerospace, to, to rocket mechanics, uh, and to, as it would turn out, banking, which is where the idea for Bitcoin came from. Um, this was something that was discussed in the cypherpunk mailing list, uh, which was uh, started in 1985 uh, by David, David Chaum, uh, where very quickly after that, uh, some guy by the name of Timothy Mays published something called the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Very interesting, there's some cool lines in there. I'm not gonna read all of them, but if you read this thing, it's like a page long, you should, you should look it up. There's some things in there that could have been written like five minutes ago, like the state will of course try to slow or halt the spread of this technology citing national security concerns or the technology is being used by drug dealers and tax evaders and there's fears of the society disintegrating. Like that could have been today, right? This is what the naysayers for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency will say about it. Um, other folks on the mailing list uh, kind of had similar similar thoughts. They uh, they all communicated. One of those other guys uh, published something a year later called the Cypherpunk Manifesto. Also very prescient. Also about a page long. Takes you five minutes to read. But you're going to be seeing things like uh, information longs to be free. You know, is one of the quotes that's kind of circulated throughout the internet ever since. Cypherpunks write code. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Which is why. You know, these are deeply political concepts, right? And this is where this all started. So this is why people recoil a little bit when you talk about cryptocurrency and uh, blockchain. It's just, it's not, it's not exactly like email. I mean, it is, it's a protocol like email, but there's some other pieces to it that are uh, a little bit more political. So these are some of the other predecessors. Did I skip one? No, there we go. These are the other predecessors to Bitcoin that were a, kind of arose out of this community of cypherpunks. There was one called Hashcash, one called B money. Uh, there was a, the idea of reusable proof of work it was created by a gentleman named Hal Finney, who was also one of the very early users of Bitcoin. He uh, uh, used some of his Bitcoin to have himself cryogenically frozen because he was suffering from ALS. Um, interesting guy, one of the smartest guys in the movement at the time. Uh, Nick Zabo, still very active in the in the Bitcoin community, he published the white paper for Bitgold, which was built on the ideas of Hal Finney and was later used in Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, um, which was October 2008. That's just when we kind of crossed the chasm into the world of Bitcoin versus the world of cypherpunk. Um, Bitcoin was first minted in 2009. Interesting side note done on a 
a CPU, if you had any type of computer at all, could have been effective at mining Bitcoin. In 2009 was the first time it was exchanged. One Bitcoin would have been uh, about 0 0.076 pennies. So for a dollar, you could buy about 1,309 Bitcoin. I did not either. Um, Bitcoin Pizza Day is kind of a big day in the world of Bitcoin. It's the first time that it was exchanged for something of real world value aside from other money. Uh, I haven't updated this slide a little bit, but this is about accurate. Uh, a Bitcoin, a pizza, uh, the pizza, the amount of Bitcoin was worth about $85 million in today's dollars. It was uh, 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas. So um, people like to point out that's a little silly, right? You know, the guy lost a lot of money for that pizza, but it is what established the, the, the idea that this could be worth a real world value. It wasn't just a plaything for geeks. Uh, around about that time was the dawn of GPU mining, which is probably the bane of a lot of people in this room's existence. Can't play games on a, C, uh, on a PC anymore. Uh, this is about when I got into it. Uh, price was around seven or nine dollars. Uh, I was a bit shocked when I, about a week or two later, it jumped up to twelve bucks. I thought this couldn't possibly be the highest it could go, and then it spiked to two, it spiked to thirty-one dollars a couple weeks later. I skipped a bunch of uh, stuff that we didn't have time for, but this was all uh, all related to Silk Road. That was why it jumped up, because Gawker published something about Silk Road. Uh, then uh, this is also around the time that solo mining ended. The idea, this is, this is kind of important if you're thinking about security and blockchain, if you're involved in creating a blockchain. Uh, the, the, the idea that at some point the difficulty of your blockchain will arise if using proof of work where people will band together to, uh, to mine it because it's no longer profitable to attempt to try to mine it on any machine that you could feasibly own as an individual or as a small organization. So that's what this is about, mining pools. People take people that are, don't even know each other from around the world will band together and join into a pool and, and share in the resources gained from mining or securing that blockchain. Bitcoin hit $100. I was on uh, a show that I was a producer for at the time saying that this is probably the peak for Bitcoin. Uh, of course, I was wrong. Um, a couple weeks, about a week and a half, two weeks later, what was that? Yeah, about a week later, Cypress banking prices hit and they started buying a ton of Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, so many people got involved uh, and the network grew to the point where GPU mining was no longer profitable uh, and ASIC mining became the thing. So this is where you have to have specialized hardware that you can't just buy off the shelf at Fry's or, or, or Best Buy or someplace. Um, so this is where we start getting interesting um, because, uh, was it around here? Yeah, so this is where the, the, the thought leadership starts to kick in uh, beyond the idea of money, beyond the idea of, of just playing around with the, you know, disrupting the banking system. They're disrupting other structures using this. So the first ICO was actually run on basic forum software, but it was the idea that you're you selling something like a security to fund what eventually became uh, the backbone for the Tether network, if you've heard of that. That's where the first stable coin has arisen. Uh, a stable coin being uh, something that's locked to the dollar or locked to other uh, monetary asset. Um, the first idea of a DAO was proposed. If you haven't heard of this, this is a fascinating concept, digital autonomous organization. Um, and a lot of the most popular games on the Ethereum network are some version of a DAO where it's a self-governing smart contract that you could, you could uh, it could be illegal in all jurisdictions, uh, but as long as it can maintain itself uh, and has incentive on, and its incentives to keep its economy functioning, uh, it doesn't matter what happens to the creators of it, it'll continue to work. So uh, and these are some bullet points from the original uh, published work about the first ideas of the DAO. DAO talks about like a, you know, it's basically the idea of paying for a security, paying the minimum amount of money uh, that you should have to pay for it to keep a security alive, or to keep the security of, of the, of the uh, smart contract alive. Um, another, I guess a low water mark here, but it was an uh, important real world thing, Silk Road uh, founder Ross, alleged Silk Road founder Ross Ulbricht was arrested. Uh, he did, of course, denied it, but he was given two lifetime sentences and all of his Bitcoins were seized. Uh, and this was kind of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, the beginning of the first winter for cryptocurrency and blockchain, which to, to me was the most exciting time because while MT Gox uh, crashed and the price dropped 70%, uh, 
um, this is where all the cool stuff started happening. You know, like it drove out all the, the, the people that were looking just to get rich. And basically the guys with uh, neck beards like me were the only ones sitting around still talking about it. You know, so uh, you see that long, flat period of time is where things like the Ethereum white paper was published or uh, the Ethereum ICO went live. So the first really successful ICO. Um, the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance was launched in March of 2014. This included people like, or organizations like the CME Group, Toyota, Samsung, Microsoft, Intel, and JP Morgan. These are all huge companies that said, look, this is, uh, this is gonna be big. We're not sure how big, but uh, we'll, we'll get involved. We'll play along. Um, Stephen Colbert mentioned Bitcoin. That was that tiny little bump you saw over here in the middle of that downside. So, um, uh, then uh, the ERC-20 standard was proposed. This is the standard uh, by which most ICOs and most tokens that are out there are based off of, which is basically saying you don't need to get out there and create your own consensus mechanism. You don't have to worry about your Byzantine fault tolerance. Just bank on Ethereum's Byzantine fault tolerance, uh, which is why you have thousands and thousands of ICOs and thousands and thousands of tokens rather than you know a couple hundred. Um, so the uh, Hyperledger Foundation was formed. This was IBM's, it was initially IBM's initiative, now it's a pretty robust alliance of multiple organizations. A lot of the same names, uh, some different ones. J.P. Morgan, Swift, Chicago Mercantile Exchange Group. Uh, it's essentially, uh, their initial idea was, yeah, we like this whole, you know, Byzantine fault tolerance stuff, but you know, we don't like tokens. So, you know, that whole thing feels icky. So we're gonna get rid of that. Um, basically, it was they were trying to have blockchain but not be associated with Silk Road. They've kind of backed off of that. There, you can do tokens with Hyperledger and Fabric and that sort of thing now. Uh, it's not a popular ICO platform, but it can be used for that. Um, this was the first point, 2016, March 24th, 2016 is when Ethereum and, uh, issued their stable release. So it really became a, a, a usable platform at this point. And uh, you know, about six months later, you know, good times are back. <laughs> Bitcoin jump starts to uh, do that rise. And this is probably where most people got familiar with the world of blockchain and cryptocurrency. It went from about $1,000 until December. It peaked at nearly $20,000. And everything got drug up along with it. Every little ICO, every little, little crap token that was issued saw meteoric gains. Um, and also, this is where people started getting very, very dogmatic about uh, what consensus mechanisms were good, what were the scaling issues, how is that going to be, if you've heard about the hard fork. Now, that's, that happened this year, in that year, July 2017. Uh, maybe beyond the scope of uh, this conversation, but if you want to ask me about it afterwards, I can get into that. October 19th, this is, uh, this is when CryptoKitties was launched. Uh, I'm a huge fan of it because it changed it changed the, uh, or it gave us the idea of non-fungible tokens, which is a very uh, important concept for this room in particular. NFTs, uh, if you're in VR and AR, I truly believe is the missing link between uh, people valuing what they do in virtual space uh, and not. Uh, because as you, as you mentioned uh, earlier in your presentation, uh, all software is about copying prior to blockchain. And true ownership with a non-fungible token uh, is, or an NFT is, is possible. So fungible versus non-fungible, it's kind of a banking term, but basically Bitcoin is fungible, meaning every Bitcoin or every piece of a Bitcoin uh, is exchangeable more or less with every other piece of a Bitcoin. Uh, uh, an NFT, you only have one token and it's unique like a trading card. So if I give you the NFT for this, this this Fiji bottle or whatever, or this chair, like you own, you can say that's the deed to that, that Fiji bottle, that chair. Or if it's a digital asset, uh, like a, uh, you know, a, a, a modeled chair in virtual space, you can say you actually own the whole chair. And when I transfer it from one blockchain address to another, it's indisputable who owns it. And there's nobody, there's no real way that someone could steal that without compromising your own personal security. So that's, this is probably like the, the biggest high water mark in the timeline for this, again, for this room. Uh, in the all, in, in the, uh, it's in the whole presentation. Uh, 
then um, this is something that actually I needed to update this slide because this just changed over the course of the last week and a half. Uh, so the end of Bitcoin dominance uh, for many years, uh, well, not many years, for about a year, uh, occurred on December 19, 2017. That basically means there was more uh, cryptocurrencies and tokens that existed that were not Bitcoin in terms of people's money being invested in them that, than them were. Um, it, happened first uh, a couple of weeks before December 19th, then it happened at December 19th and stayed that way until about a couple weeks ago, and then it dipped back above 51%, uh, the, the dominance of Bitcoin, and it's trending back down again. So what, did, what does that mean? What that means is not necessarily that people are investing or value is being created that isn't Bitcoin. What it is is that more assets that aren't a virtual currency are being indexed on a blockchain and being made publicly transparent. That can be anything from shares of stock to cryptocurrency to crypto kitties to uh, deeds to a house. And once we just, I mean, things are being indexed all the time. We don't necessarily know that they are until they're discovered or they're publicized. And then Bitcoin dominance is eventually going to trend down to you know one percent or five percent or some number of that because there's so many things in this world. It's like how much uh, it's like saying USD dominance or you know if you track USD versus other currencies, yeah maybe it's a huge share, but USD versus all real estate in the world and you know all trading cards or whatever you know. So that's that kind of gives you the idea of what that number is and what the significance is. So, uh, key learnings and my puppy tax. My puppy is named Token. Um, so, uh, I, like I say, it's a long road from respectability uh, from a gleam, or to respectability from a gleam in the eyes of forum operators to one of the most disruptive technologies in the modern age. There's some parallels, I think, that could be probably drawn between the, uh, the, the winters of crypto and uh, what I heard yesterday with some of the, the VR winters. Um, so, I think that's. You could, you could probably ask me questions about that and I can give you insights about what it felt like and how we returned to the public eye and what we had to do to do that. I think blockchain is the missing link between VR and mainstream adoption. I explained why that is. Uh, the stack that has given rise to NFTs is the pathway to this deeper meaning. And I think uh, if you're going to get into blockchain, the cultural history of Bitcoin and blockchain is important to get into. Like, cause you have, cause it's, it's not just uh, informative and fun. It's also going to give you uh, an understanding of, of why uh, these opinionated and dogmatic frameworks were encoded into uh, a protocol. Um, it's it's, it's a political, not necessarily in the negative sense that we think about in politics and people yelling at each other, but political in the sense that it, it, has, it, it encodes certain ideas about ownership and property into a, a means of communication. And uh, that's it. So um, do we have time for questions? Are we over? A little bit of time? Okay. That's a quote from Satoshi. It's, uh, if you don't believe me or don't get it, I don't have time to try to convince you. So we've got a couple <laughs> minutes for you to try to convince you. Um, any questions? Yes. Um, I've got a, a question. It might be too hard for the time you've got. But like, a lot of the time it feels like your main focus sort of switches from Bitcoin to Ethereum along the way. And I was hoping you could kind of like give us a quick Compare and contrast those two as they stand today. It's just—it's interesting to me just to see the focus of what you're talking about moving. Sure. Well, I think for this room, and the reason why I spent a lot more time on Ethereum than Bitcoin is for this room, Ethereum is a more relevant technology. Um, the the two the main differentiator, and I have to go all the way back to the beginning to look at that token framework uh, thing, is that Ethereum is what's called a Turing complete blockchain, and Bitcoin is not. So to explain that in non-blockchain merit terms is to say that like Bitcoin is a ledger like a paper ledger, Ethereum is a ledger like an Excel sheet. So you can put computations and programs into it and it will self-execute like smart contracts. Um, Bitcoin is only has limited usability to folks that are trying to really develop applications on the blockchain. They have to use something called layer two solutions, which means kind of making a whole ton of technology stack decisions that's all built into Ethereum. Good question, though. Thank you. Anything else? I, I got another. Sure. Um, can you comment on Ripple a little bit? Is that something that you in your purview that? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was one of the many things I had to cut out of this, but. Um, 
the, the it's a it's a mostly it's a security with very limited utility. It's uh, it's essentially uh, in terms of an investment vehicle, it's a little bit like uh, buying stock in the company Ripple, because it the price will move not based upon how people use it, but based upon how well the company's doing. If the company just made an announcement like two day, two or three days ago, and it jumped like 100% in value, and it. it the amounts that they made had nothing to do with the utility of the token. Um, that's not to say it's a bad technology. I think it's very useful and it's interesting, especially if you're in the banking sector. Um, and I have a video, if you do, uh, if you just search on Ask Dr. Bitcoin, that goes like 10 minutes into what Ripple's about. I have thoughts on it. Good question. What else? I've got, uh, I've got a question. Yes. Um, we hear a lot of stories about uh, some jurisdictions like China and South Korea, uh, for example, being anti-crypto. Um, mm. What are your thoughts around that? What do you think? You know, what do you, do you think they're going to move away from that position? What do you think? How do you think they're going to feel about sort of non-threatening crypto, like um, you know, digital assets in the video game space? Um, China in specific, or just other? Yeah. Um, so. There's a, actually there's a really interesting arm race right, happening right now. Um, it, it, with our ICO clients, we find they uh, are uh, being courted by smaller countries that have been marginalized by American and Chinese banking interests because, you know, like Malta or uh, like uh, Antigua or, you know, you know they, they're, they're basically all vying to be the new Switzerland for crypto. And so that's interesting. Um, and they are pushing forward the larger interests because a ton of ICOs moved to Malta and uh, a ton of ICOs moved to Singapore. <coughs> um, in fact, the first client that I helped ICO back in 2016, they had to close down their business in America and, and they're like a, like a billion dollar company. They literally had to shut down their business and re uh, domicile it in Singapore because of the kind of oppressiveness of the SEC was just targeting them. They're like, you know what, it's fine, we'll just take it over there. And they had the choice of countries to redomicile in. And I think, you know, you lose a few billion here and a few billion there, it becomes real money. You know, America and China go like, wait, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. So China, maybe not as much because they've got other ways to restrict migration of capital, unlike in the US is a little bit more open about it, but it's, this was built to circumvent those types of uh, capital controls, so maybe not. Great question. Anything else? Oh. Great, I appreciate uh, you guys letting me talk to you guys. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Mark. That was fantastic. Um, all right, our next speaker.